TV chefs, best-selling authors, and Academy Award winners. Some of the most famous figures of the 20th century came to America with dreams of a better future and found success beyond the gates of Ellis Island. Probably the most famous monster movie actor in history, Bela Lugosi starred in 18 films for Universal Studios during the 1930s and 1940s. He played vampires on four occasions, notably Count Dracula in 1931's Dracula and 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. I am Dracula. It's Lugosi's characterization that established the tropes associated with the character and vampires in general, including the cape, Eastern European accent, and spooky body language. In October 1920, Lugosi served on the crew of the SS Graf Tisa Eastvet as it departed Trieste, Italy, bound for New Orleans. Upon arrival, he received permission from the captain to explore the city and never return to the boat. Police and the Immigration and Naturalization Service received word, but Lugosi wasn't apprehended for months. He was finally located at a boarding house in a Hungarian neighborhood in New York in March 1921. Lugosi was sent to Ellis Island for processing, entering the facility by land instead of ship. At the time, an anti-communist Red Scare was underway in the U.S. and Europe. As Lugosi had been associated with leftist groups in Hungary, he could have been immediately deported for his beliefs. But he lied about his homeland, claiming to be from Romania. Already a good actor, he threw off immigration inspectors and was allowed to remain in the U.S. Isaac Asimov is best known for his landmark works of popular science fiction. He created Asimov's science fiction magazine and wrote best-selling novels, including I, Robot, The Foundation series, and Fantastic Voyage, to name a few. Also a medical school professor and philosopher, Asimov wrote, compiled, and edited more than 500 works of fiction and nonfiction over his lifetime. Asimov was two years old when his mother's brother wrote her in Petrovichy, Russia, from the United States. Curious if she'd survived World War I and the Russian Revolution, he suggested the Asimovs immigrate to the U.S. and offered to sponsor their move in January 1923. Just after his third birthday, Asimov departed the Soviet Union, sailing from Riga, Latvia to Liverpool, England, and then to Ellis Island. Their ship, the Baltic, arrived on February 3rd. After disembarking, Asimov's father realized they'd lost track of the boy's mother. In his essay, Ellis Island and I, Asimov wrote, The men and women were separated, and he didn't see her for four days. I increased the joy of the occasion by coming down with measles, which may have delayed the reunion. After his father assured an interviewer that he'd immediately seek employment, the family reunited. Just 15 months later, the U.S. government instituted immigration laws limiting traffic from Eastern Europe. Asimov theorized, we would undoubtedly not have been able to get in. Irving Berlin is regarded as one of the chief architects of the Great American Songbook, the collection of pop and jazz standards dating to the early 20th century. But he wasn't born in the U.S. Born in Russia as Israel Bailin, Berlin wrote about 1,000 songs, many of them familiar a century later, including Alexander's Ragtime Band, Putin on the Ritz, and White Christmas, estimated to be the best-selling single of all time. Exceedingly patriotic when it came to his adopted homeland, Berlin wrote God Bless America, a widely considered unofficial national anthem of the United States. Late 19th century anti-Semitic pogroms in Russia included the destruction of Jewish villages or shtetls, including the one in Siberia, where the Berlin's family lived until they fled persecution for the United States in 1893. He remembers hiding in a ditch with his brothers and sisters and parents, uh, watching Russian Cossacks burn down their village. Departing from Antwerp, Belgium, in the steerage section of the Rhineland, eight members of the musician's family, including five-year-old Israel, arrived at Ellis Island in September. Upon entry into the U.S., the Bylins changed the family name to Berlin, and Israel would further adapt his name to Irving Berlin. One of the most famous and influential figures in early 20th century football, when the college version was the culturally dominant form of the sport, Newt Rockne captained the team at the University of Notre Dame. He helped devise and popularize the forward pass, now the offensive standard. Rockne never left Notre Dame. After graduation, he signed on as an assistant coach and in 1918 became head coach and athletic director. In his 13-year career, Rockne's squads went 105, 12, and 5, with five undefeated seasons and three national championships. Don't forget, man, we're going to get him on the run, we're going to go, 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 and we aren't going to stop until we go to that goal line. It all came to a tragic and abrupt end in 1931 when Rockne died in a plane crash. In 1893, five-year-old Newt Rockne and his mother departed Voss, Norway, and headed for New York. 
Ellis Island was a mandatory stop before they headed to Chicago, where Rockne's father, Lars, had helped build a grand carriage to be exhibited at that year's World's Fair. In a 2004 ceremony in front of the Statue of Liberty, Rockne's only living son, John, accepted the Ellis Island Family Heritage Award, given to the descendants of immigrants who passed through the facility before making significant contributions to American life. American movies have long romanticized the lives of mobsters and organized criminals, and this can largely be traced back to Little Caesar, a 1931 film starring Edward G. Robinson as a ruthless gangster. If you ain't out of town by tomorrow morning, you won't never leave it except in a pine box. Real-life crime figures reportedly adopted some of Robinson's mannerisms, blurring the line between fiction and reality. Robinson specialized in portraying toughs, criminals, and bad guys on stage, in the controversial band in Chicago, The Racket, and on screen, including in Smart Money, Five Star Final, Kid Galahad, and A Slight Case of Murder. He appeared in more than 100 movies and received an honorary Oscar at the 1973 Academy Awards. In 1904, 10-year-old Emanuel Goldenberg left Romania with his family, fleeing anti-Semitic violence and persecution. The Goldenbergs found enough money to buy steerage tickets on a steamship and sailed to the United States, some months after patriarch Moritz Goldenberg had settled in New York. When the family arrived at Ellis Island on February 21st, they were held at the facility for two days. They hadn't received proper medical clearances in Romania and had to wait for it to be sorted out. Let no one believe that landing on the shores is a pleasant experience. It is a hard, harsh fact. Nevertheless, it was a defining experience for Robinson. He once wrote, At Ellis Island, I was born again. Life for me began when I was 10 years old. An early 20th century fitness celebrity, pitchman, and model, Charles Atlas championed physical culture and weightlifting, promoting what he deemed as the ideal physique, his. Atlas came up with Dynamic Tension, a program of exercises in which muscles work opposite each other to create growth and development. He sold mail-order instructions via comic book ads, depicting a young, scrawny guy tired of beach bullies kicking sand in his face. He claimed this happened to him, and that he was inspired to bulk up after seeing a statue of the Greek god Atlas at Coney Island. Just before he turned 11 years old, Atlas, still known as Angelo Siciliano, left Acre, Italy in steerage class on board the SS Roma with his mother mother, aunt, and grandparents. Upon arrival at the Ellis Island Processing Center on September 11, 1903, the family was held back due to his grandparents' medical issues. Doctors ultimately decided the health problems were non-threatening and allowed the Sicilianos into the country. Johnny Weissmuller found fame and success in two different realms. He first became known as a champion swimmer. At the 1924 Paris Olympics, Weissmuller won gold medals for the United States in the 100-meter freestyle, the 4x200-meter team relay event, and the 400-meter freestyle. Also a member of the U.S. national water polo team, Weissmuller won a bronze medal in that sport. Returning to Olympic competition at the 1928 Games in Amsterdam, Weissmuller repeated his gold medal-winning performances in the 100-meter and relay events. In between, in 1927, the swimmer set a 100-yard freestyle record, one of 28 records he set across his athletic career. Eventually, Hollywood called, and Weissmuller followed up his athletic career with a second act as a movie star. On screen, Weissmuller played the lead role in 12 Tarzan movies, then starred in even more Tarzan-esque Jungle Jim films. Take knife, Nazi! Born Johan Weissmuller in Pardani, a town in Romania near the Serbian border, the athlete and actor slightly anglicized his name to Johnny Weissmuller after his arrival in the United States. Along with his German parents, he traveled in steerage in the SS Rotterdam, which docked for passenger processing at Ellis Island in January 1905. The family briefly lived in Chicago, then settled in Winbur, Pennsylvania, the home of Weissmuller's mother's brother, who had previously immigrated to the U.S. Filmmaker Frank Capra wrote and directed some of the most heartwarming American films of the 1930s and 40s. A celebrity director whose name was prominently featured in his movie's marketing materials, Capra directed classics like Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, State of the Union, and Best Picture winners It Happened One Night and You Can't Take It With You. But Capra's most famous film is the perennial Christmas favorite It's a Wonderful Life. Altogether, Capra won three Oscars for Best Director. According to Joseph McBride's Frank Capra, the catastrophe of success, the filmmaker remembered his Ellis Island experience as somewhat chaotic, saying, There was a lot of noise and a lot of chairs, and we sat on the chairs and waited for two days. Capra and his family arrived in New York City days after his sixth birthday in May 1903, having sailed in steerage class from Sicily on board the SS Germania. 
The face and name on cans of ravioli and beefaroni belong to a real person, Ettore Boyardi, worked in hotel restaurants in New York City and West Virginia, where he helped cater the reception for President Woodrow Wilson's 1915 wedding. In 1924, Boyardi opened his own restaurant, Il Giardino d'Italia, in Cleveland. Chef Boyardi started to use a phonetic spelling of his last name, Boyardi, so his customers could more easily pronounce it. Boyardi said, Everyone is proud of his own family name, but sacrifices were necessary for progress. Chef Boyardi products hit stores in 1928 and were nationally distributed by American Home Foods by 1938. So ask your grocer for Chef Boyardi's spaghetti dinner with meat or mushroom sauce, won't you? The chef's culinary journey started in his home nation of Italy, where at age 11, he began working as an apprentice in a hotel kitchen in the town of Piacenza. In 1914, when he was around 17 years old, Boyardi came to the U.S. on the La Lorraine, sailing out of Borgonovo, Italy. Boyardi entered the U.S. at Ellis Island and reunited with his brother Paolo, who had already immigrated to New York. Before the rise of TV or radio, American entertainment consisted mostly of vaudeville and Broadway. By 1920, Al Jolson had become a superstar in both, helping to popularize African-American musical forms such as ragtime and jazz with white audiences. Marketing himself as the world's greatest entertainer, Jolson gave motion pictures a boost when he starred in The Jazz Singer in 1927, the first feature film with a synchronized dialogue soundtrack. A biopic called The Jolson Story revived his career in the late 1940s, at which point he focused on showing his thanks to the country that made him rich and successful by traveling the globe to entertain American troops stationed overseas. Jolson was born into a Jewish family in Lithuania in 1886. He was about seven years old when he entered the country after submitting to processing at Ellis Island. Where'd you learn to sing like that? Well, I sing with my father at the synagogue. In later years, seeking to avoid strong anti-immigration hostilities sweeping the U.S. at the time, Jolson falsely reported his place of birth as Washington, D.C. The inspiration for the stage musical and classic film The Sound of Music, Maria Von Trapp married into the Von Trapp family and led her brood of stepchildren in a family musical act that was popular throughout Europe in the 1930s. When World War II began, the Austrian Von Trapps were scheduled to sing in Sweden, but the concert was cancelled when the Swedish government directed all foreign nationals to return home. Instead, with the assistance of their agent, the family left on the SS Bergensfjord, bound for New York. They're gone. During processing, an Ellis Island inspector asked Von Trapp how long she'd be in the U.S. According to her biography, Maria Von Trapp, Beyond the Sound of Music, she replied, I am so glad to be here. I never want to leave again. Immigration officials took her boisterous comment literally, and the whole Von Trapp family was questioned for hours. That was a, quite an experience, to be in a place where the doors have no handles on your side. After being detained for four days, a judge asked Von Trapp to explain her comments, considering that she had only a six-month visa. She claimed it was an offhand comment, but he didn't buy it. Even so, a few days later, Maria Von Trapp and her family were allowed to leave the Ellis Island prison and set off on a concert tour. A landmark moment in American cultural history the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s is an umbrella term to encapsulate the explosive creativity and remarkable literature that emerged from the black community in New York City. Claude McKay wrote about his experiences as a black man years before he came to the United States. After publishing two poetry collections in 1912, Songs of Jamaica and Constep Ballads, McKay received a cash award from the Jamaican Institute of Arts and Sciences, which funded his immigration to the U.S. Born in Jamaica, Festus Claudius McKay traveled in steerage class on a ship that arrived at Ellis Island in 1912. In his memoir, A Long Way From Home, McKay wrote, At last the ship was moored and I came down to the pavement. Ellis Island. Doctors peered in my eyes, officials scrutinized my passport, and the gates were thrown open. More than a movie star, radio performer, and comic, Bob Hope is remembered for entertaining American troops. From World War II and well into the 1990s, Hope traveled to wherever soldiers were to provide respite in the form of comedy and variety acts. Hope performed Christmas shows at military bases for more than 50 years, many of them doubling as annual TV events. Uh, more blood, make me braver. Congress named Hope an honorary veteran in 1997, and when Hope died in 2003, President George W. Bush ordered American flags on government buildings to fly at half-mast. America embraced Hope just as Hope embraced America. 
Just before his fifth birthday in 1908, Pope departed Southampton, England with his mother and siblings. His father left Europe a year before to work as a stonemason in Cleveland. In Ellis Island interviews, immigrants tell their own stories, Pope recalled, I remember getting the vaccination for the steamship before we left and trying to run away from the doctor. He caught me. Pope was too young to recall many details from the voyage, but shared, We were only at Ellis Island for a few hours. But I do remember standing with my mother and five brothers on the boat as it entered New York Harbor for the first time and seeing the lights and the Statue of Liberty. Maximilian Pektorovich grew up in Woods, Poland in the 19th century. His mother died when he was just two years old. He never attended school because he had to sell fruit to theater goers to feed himself and his eight siblings. He worked as an apprentice for many years before landing a job in Moscow at Corpo, contracted to do the wigs and makeup for the Imperial Russian Opera. Around 1900, he opened his own shop selling cosmetics and hair pieces he created. His work was considered so excellent that he became the Russian Imperial Court's supplier. In the U.S., Faktorovich found work in the early film industry, adapting stage makeup into innovative movie makeup and hair treatments. By the 1930s, he'd expanded into retail, selling Max Factor products in American department stores. Following an alarming upswing in anti-Semitism in Russia, which included pogroms and the systematic murder of Jewish people, Faktorovich and his wife and three children decamped to Bohemia. They then walked 300 miles to Hamburg to board the U.S.-bound SS Moltka. Upon his arrival at Ellis Island in February 1904, he gave a truncated version of his name, Max Factor, to the immigration officer, which was registered as heard, Max Factor. Spencer Tracy won the Academy Award for Best Actor for portraying a famous and aggressively humanitarian priest, Father Edward Flanagan, in 1938's Boys Town. The film purported to tell the true story of the real Father Flanagan, a Roman Catholic man of faith who opens a charity home and school for abandoned, overlooked, and unwanted children. The film was produced on the campus of the actual Boys Town, which was established in Nebraska in 1917 and grew into a sprawling network of services and facilities for minors in need. Flanagan's vision was to provide an alternative to stark and potentially abusive juvenile detention centers. Kindness and love will open the heart of any problem boy. Flanagan was barely out of childhood himself when he immigrated to the U.S. only 13 years before he started Boys Town. Seeking to study for the priesthood in the United States, 18-year-old Flanagan, with his sister pretending to be his wife, as well as his brother, booked passage in steerage class on the RMS Celtic, departing from County Cork in Ireland near the end of August 1904 and docking at Ellis Island. Born in Turkey to a Greek family, Ilya Kazan found success on Broadway in the mid-20th century, staging productions of significant American plays of the era, including Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire and Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman and All My Sons. The latter two netted the director two Tony Awards. A move into film proved fruitful, with his thoughtful, politically-minded work winning Kazan two Academy Awards for directing, for the classic saga about corrupt dock workers on the waterfront and the anti-Semitism-themed Gentleman's Agreement. Kazan arrived at Ellis Island in 1913, around the time of his fourth birthday, aboard the ship Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosha, traveling with his parents in steerage. Although he was very young during the journey, Kazan drew from that experience, along with that of his grandfather, who had arrived nine years before them when writing his 1962 novel America, America. And every American family, without exception, has one particular legend, the one which tells of how the family first came to this country. In an interview at the Museum of Modern Art, Kazan said, My paternal grandfather deserted the Tsar's army to reach Ellis Island in 1904. He never learned to read or write English, but his descendants all benefited from his journey into the unknown. CBS's mid-century talent showcase Toast of the Town, also known as The Ed Sullivan Show, was so popular that a single appearance, let alone a regular spot, could create instantaneous national fame. Such was the case for Senor Wenzes, a puppeteer and ventriloquist who performed on The Ed Sullivan Show 23 times between 1950 and 1971. He captivated audiences with his puppets that seemed almost alive. Senor Wenzes' most famous characters included a jokester chicken named Cecilia, Johnny, who had a puppet body, blonde wig, and wins his hand for a face, and Pedro, a head that lived inside a box who uttered the memorable catchphrase, Sorry. After the Ed Sullivan show went off the air in 1971, Senor Wences remained in demand, performing at the White House, on The Muppet Show, and on Broadway. Born and raised in Salamanca, Spain, 
under the name Wenceslao Moreno. Wences had a career as a bullfighter until a nearly fatal accident at age 15 inspired him to join the circus. There he learned juggling, acrobatics, and ultimately discovered a knack for ventriloquism. He toured his act around Europe for years before he decided to try his luck in the United States. In 1936, Wenceslao sailed on a ship bound for Ellis Island. Upon arrival, he was temporarily stopped by officials who weren't convinced the vaudeville engagements he had arranged were legitimate. First published in 1923, upwards of 9 million copies of The Prophet have sold in the United States, making its author, Khalil Gibran, the third best-selling poet in history. His collection of 26 philosophical poems, presented as lectures, is often quoted and widely used as an instructional aid and spiritually-oriented self-help guide. Gibran's influence on modern poetry and philosophy is such that several New York City public schools were named in his honor. In 1895, when he was 12 years old, Gibran and his family departed Lebanon, which was at the time part of Syria. They were Christians, seeking sanctuary from the strictly Islamic Ottoman Empire. We will escort you to your port of emigration. I'm gonna miss him too. Gibran and his family landed at Ellis Island on June 17, 1895 and settled in Boston. Gibran loved his homeland too much to ever seek full U.S. citizenship. In fact, he temporarily returned to Lebanon to further his studies in 1898, just three years after his immigration. Ayn Rand wrote fiction as a means to explore and promote her philosophy of objectivism, a fierce and unflinching style of individualism and exceptionalism that would drive a politically conservative movement in the 20th and 21st centuries. I right. call it objectivism, All right. meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. In best-selling works like Anthem, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged, Rand, who was born Elisa Rosenbaum in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1905, lionized capitalists, maverick businessmen, freethinkers, and other characters who embodied ideals perceived as all-American. After studying literature at the University of Petrograd, Rosenbaum made plans to see family in Chicago and secured a tourist visa. The journey from Russia to the Midwest took her through Ellis Island in February 1926, where the 21-year-old was quickly processed. She never returned to Russia, then in its early communist era, opting instead to head to Hollywood to give screenwriting a try, changing her name to Ayn Rand. She'd written We the Living and Anthem by the end of the 1930s. After marrying actor Frank O'Connor in 1929, Rand acquired full American citizenship in 1931. Easily the most popular 20th century Yiddish language writer, Isaac Bushevis Singer would later incorporate English into his work and become a best-selling author. Born in Poland while it was under the control of Russia's czars, Singer spent his childhood in a walled ghetto. He wrote about the European Jewish experience in fictional works like Enemies, A Love Story, Yentl, The Yeshiva Boy, The Slave, and The Magician of Lublin. In 1978, Singer won the Nobel Prize for Literature, a little over a decade before his death in 1991. Singer had planned to become a rabbi, like his father and grandfather, but with the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party in Germany in the 1930s, anti-Semitism increased in Poland. In Ellis Island interviews, immigrants tell their stories in their own words, Singer says, This was one of the reasons, or perhaps the main reason, why I wanted to get away from there. With ambitions to be an author and to study with his brother, a writer who'd already immigrated to the U.S., 31-year-old Singer secured a tourist visa and, in 1935, booked a tourist-class ticket on the Champlain, a French ship. Singer recalled, The first thing I saw from the ship was the Statue of Liberty, and it always made a great impression on me. Nearly always portrayed as a suave and charming leading man, Cary Grant was among the biggest stars of Hollywood's mid-20th century golden age. Oh, you're that type. What? Honest. Not really. Good, because all these women frighten me. Grant starred in all kinds of films, but he enjoyed true success with the romantic comedies, including The Philadelphia Story and Bringing Up Baby, and thrillers directed by Alfred Hitchcock, such as North by Northwest and Suspicion. He was twice nominated for Academy Awards, but after making Walk, Don't Run in 1966, Grant spent the final two decades of his life in retirement. Grant's career began on the stage, under his real name of Archibald Alexander Leach. Born in Bristol, England, he joined a traveling theatrical troupe that toured the United States in 1920. The 16-year-old was processed at Ellis Island and permitted to enter the country on employment grounds. But when the troupe's tour wrapped up and they headed back to England, Leach stayed behind. He played Broadway in the vaudeville circuit, then went to Hollywood to make movies, whereupon he adopted the stage name of Cary Grant. 
In 1942, well into his film career, Grant became a full American citizen. 